Your Royal Highness, Prince Zayed Rad Zayed Al Muslim, permanent representative of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the United Nations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISAS, we warmly welcome you to today's distinguished visitor lecture by His Royal Highness Prince Zayed Rad Zayed Al Hussein. It's my pleasure now to invite the Director of the Institute, Professor Tan Tayong, to do his opening remarks. Professor Tan, please. Excellencies, friends, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the ISS Distinguished Visitor Lecture. I am delighted and honoured to introduce His Royal Highness Prince Zayed Rad Zayed Al Hussein, who has graciously agreed to deliver this afternoon's distinguished lecture on a subject that is not generally associated with royalty's uh, daily agenda. <laughs> we suggested this topic because, as you will discover shortly, uh, Prince Zayed, being a versatile and proactive diplomat with an extraordinary career profile in diverse fields, is eminently qualified to talk about this subject. Currently, uh, Prince Zayed is the Kingdom of Jordan's permanent representative to the United Nations, a high office which he first held for six and a half years uh, between 2000 and 2007. His first tenure at the helm of his country's mission at the uh, UN in New York was preceded by a four-year term as Deputy Permanent Representative with the higher rank of Ambassador. Uh, between his current appointment and his last appointment at the UN, he served as Jordan's Ambassador to the United States. The subject that Prince Zayed has chosen for the ISIS Distinguished Visitor Lecture today flows from his rich experience as an acknowledged expert in a tricky domain of international justice. He played a crucial role in the establishment of the International Criminal Court, ICC. Not surprisingly, he was duly elected first president of the governing body of the ICC in September 2002. This was the time when ICC was still very much a project in, on a drawing board uh, the ICC did not even have a, a site address, and in a short period of three years, uh, the Prince uh, molded the institution into what it stands for today. The Prince uh, Association, the ICC, has many dimensions. Uh, to be noted in particular, this is chairmanship of the final stages of international negotiations on the definition of uh, crimes or aggression. He has also played a key civilizing role in defining the US peace mandate. He drafted a strategy for the elimination of sexual exploitation and abuse in UN peacekeeping operations. Um, just as a little aside before I hand the podium over to the Prince, His Royal Highness was born on 26 January 1964. Now, 26 January also happens to be Republic Day of India, uh, a country which is of much interest to people like us in ISIS. But let me hasten to add that uh, ISIS has no uh, Republican agenda uh, for, the, for the Hashemite King, Kingdom of Jordan, which the Prince so ably represents. So it is my pleasure now to welcome the Prince to speak to us. Thank you, uh, Professor Tan, for your kind remarks and warm uh, welcome. Uh, Your Excellency's friends, uh, distinguished members of the Faculty of ISAS and the Law School, uh, I am truly honored and delighted to be with you here today. And having spent many years on the diplomatic uh, circuit, I have come to admire greatly uh, not just the way Singapore has articulated its foreign policy, uh, infused as it has always been with a great deal of common sense and high intelligence, but also the very high caliber of its diplomats, and here I wish to acknowledge uh, the, one of the uh, former representatives at the UN, Ambassador Menon, and uh, his lovely wife, Jainty, who were uh, outstanding in putting forward uh, the uh, positions that Singapore uh, adopted while I was in, at the UN, or while he was at the UN, I'm still there. Um, and I'm also grateful to Ambassador Chagri, who himself was a, was a greatly admired diplomat uh, while serving at the UN for broaching the idea of my visiting uh, ISAS, and I'm thankful to him for his help in arranging uh, this uh, lecture. The task that I have uh, set myself this afternoon is not easy, given the provocative nature of the title, 
uh, and that I will plow into an open discussion with myself. Uh, and there is inevitable risk uh, tied up with this uh, second point, as demonstrated by the wonderful story uh, of a teacher who asked a very young boy named Harold, Harold, what do you call a person who keeps on talking when people are no longer interested? And so little Harold looked up at the ceiling, thought a little, and then gazed back and responded gingerly, a teacher. Um, as, uh, as someone who lectures uh, frequently, and I'm sure Professor Tan would agree, we don't understand how people could find us boring. Um, after all, I have often said to my uh, younger brothers, let's have an interesting conversation, I'll do all the talking. Uh, now this would be difficult uh, to do with an audience like you, who is so well versed in the affairs of Asia and also on legal issues. Uh, for parts of this presentation, and with full disclosure, I will draw on part of a lecture I delivered uh, in 2008 to the American Society of International Law. Uh, I will first endeavor to explain why I think there is a case to be made uh, for Asian indifference in respect of atrocity crimes, and then argue why I think precaution inherent to this uh, requires a rethinking or reassessment. Uh, first, the case for indifference. The clearest gauge and easiest index to use is the overall number of ratifications by states uh, of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the first permanent international court designed to support states in ending impunity for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. Uh, out of a total number of 193 members of the United <coughs> Nations, 121 states have thus far ratified the Rome Statute. Asia can claim only 17 states parties, most of whom are from the Pacific, led by Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Samoa. We only have one state from West Asia, that being Jordan, and one from the subcontinent, uh, Bangladesh, and only two from the ASEAN countries, Cambodia and the Philippines. Uh, many of the most prominent countries in Asia, China, India, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam, for example, have yet to accede to the Rome Statute. In short, no other region is as underrepresented as Asia is relative to its overall size and number. Now, why is this so? And why, given our worldly universe of some 10,000 cultures, is the bulk of Asia so different from the other continents in this respect? Anecdotally, too, uh, only days ago, the Asian group in New York had to grapple with the lingering case of a former Sri Lankan general, now turned senior diplomat, who was nominated by the group to be its representative on a UN senior advisory group appointed by the Secretary General. I will spare you the details, save to note that once the media began to report on the controversial nature of the Sri Lankan nominee and an alleged connection to specific events in 2009, the Asian group's immediate inclination was to stand with its nominee without paying any regard to the basis of the controversy. Automatically, it seems, uh, almost instinctively, we join the strong, side with the official, and believe him or her without even considering there may be an alternative uh, view. Beyond personal experiences, the exercise of international criminal justice in Asia, whenever it has occurred, has also never been smooth, starting with the controversial uh, Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal and the cogent concerns expressed by Judge Powell in his famous dissenting opinion relating to the moral imbalance of victor's justice. International criminal justice has courted controversy from the experiences of settling criminal accountability in Timor-Leste to the continuous challenges that have dogged the Cambodia hybrid tribunal. Perhaps most glaring of all is the hiatus and absence in the conduct of trials in Asia for crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, 
between 1948 and 2001. And yet, and yet, perhaps the very sparse number of international trials tells the story. We are still experimenting here. And is it not entirely normal that Asian countries, and not just Asian countries, should express a certain amount of caution? After all, new international legal institutions, not yet properly tested, could still be abused or misused for other political ends. Why should our governments place their trust in these intergovernmental bodies when our history, and in particular our 20th century history, was frequently marked by Western deception and occasional betrayal? The British betrayed my own grandfather in 1917 when they reneged on an agreement formed two years uh, earlier and chose instead to carve up the Middle East with the French. The shipwrecks of our past remain to be remembered, are they not? And yet, is it not also unusual that given the history of Asia uh, in the 20th century, the colonialisms of yesteryear, its humiliations and cruelties, the occupation of large parts of Southeast Asia in the Second World War, the wars in Indochina prior to and during the Cold War, the revolutions themselves, and the bloodletting produced by all of this, that there should be so little sensitivity now to the suffering of the individual victim. I could understand it if this was not our collective history, if that were the collective history of another region, marked by peace within communities and between communities. Now, I am too tough, uh, am I not? Of course there is empathy in Asia with the suffering of others. Whatever we may be, most of us are not without conscience, and the, great, the greatest force or forces that move us, like others, are individual acts of kindness and expressions of love. Where I believe the problem resides is that international criminal accountability has become entangled with human rights considerations which remain messy and still the subject of much debate. We do not agree between ourselves, nor between ourselves as Asians and many of our Western friends, on a host of issues from freedom of expression and where the line must be drawn in respect of blasphemy or incitement, to penal matters reflecting different uh, cultural traditions. And out of this lack of clear convergence stems, I believe, our differences on that natural extension of human rights concerns, international criminal accountability itself. And here is where part of the problem exists, I believe. Essentially, there is a misunderstanding. Uh, let's now turn to the detail. Fundamental to any real appreciation of what atrocity crimes are is the realization that they are not in any sense ordinary crimes or abuses. There is little in common between uh, normal criminality and the outer extremity of human misconduct. I would ask you to consider, for example, the description provided by the Nuremberg uh, Criminal Tribunal in its 1947 judgment following the main proceedings in the trial of the Einsatzgruppen, the SS paramilitary death squads that operated in Eastern Europe during World War II. The tribunal found that, and I quote, if what the prosecution maintains is true, we have here participation in a crime of such unprecedented brutality and of such inconceivable savagery that the mind rebels against its own thought image and the imagination staggers in the contemplation of a human degradation beyond the power of language to adequately portray." End quote. The mind rebels against its own thought image. Indeed, if asked today, many of the distinguished judges at either of the two ad hoc international tribunals, the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, would probably acknowledge that a career filled with exposure to ordinary crimes is little preparation for the surprise and revulsion they feel when encountering subsequently the foulest of human extremes. For these crimes and their ill, as opposed to ordinary crimes, 
are crimes committed not just against the person or persons, but as all of you know, their scale and gravity dictate otherwise. They are crimes committed against the whole, crimes committed against humanity itself. If one seeks to patrol these currents in understanding what all of this means, one also ought to know as best one can the nature of the currents they patrol. When it comes to abuses committed in war or against humanity as a whole, more lawyers and, acad and academics who write about them, I believe, need to assume less about these crimes and no more. In other words, they need to be in a war or be where these victims, uh, where these crimes find expression to grasp very simply the thinnest slice of what a victim experiences. And it is, and it is not the same as claiming in an, in an ordinary context that one must witness a murder to know uh, the pain of the victim. We know enough about what a murder is without actually needing to see such a crime unfold before us. However, when we talk or write about the atrocity crimes, there is a more pressing need for us to feel firsthand the extent to which the environment contributes toward the suffering of the potential victim, quite aside from the physical deprivations they experience, like the immobilizing fear associated with not knowing if or when their turn to bear the incomprehensible will come. And it is incomprehensible, even to those who have devoted their lives to the criminal sciences. For me, the formative experiences in this regard date back to my service uh, with the UN in the former Yugoslavia, where I was posted between February 1994 and uh, January 1996. Two moments uh, during the war in particular stand out the sniping of children in Sarajevo, and a UN trip I was part of to Germany in October 1994. Early in 1995, a Bosnian family contacted uh, UN colleagues about helping the family of two little girls struck and wounded by a sniper. They wanted to smuggle the two girls out of Sarajevo so the latter could receive treatment and schooling in the United States. The Bosnian government, under siege at the time in Sarajevo, had forbidden any of its citizens from leaving the capital. Nevertheless, so pressing were the needs of the two girls, they got out. They subsequently arrived in the US where they were treated and where they received some schooling before incidentally returning home to Sarajevo once the, once the fighting had ended. What was appalling to me was the shooting itself. Even in the bloody convulsions of war, certain acts can still leave one stunned, and this was one of them. That a sniper had placed his telescopic sight on two small children half a mile away, revealed to us that the gunman was sober, his aim would otherwise have been thrown off. And so he was determined, intent, coolly, on killing, if not maiming, a seven-year-old and her younger sister. Hardly a defensive action driven by military necessity. And all too often when we trivialize, trivialize the wounds by referring to them, sorry, and all too often we then trivialize the wounds by referring to them as collateral damage. The surest companion of war then is criminality, but not of the normal variety. Rather, it is a criminality of a revolting extreme. On the morning of the 11th of October 1994, I was part of a UN delegation making its way from Bonn uh, to the old German town of Goethe in formerly East Germany. And as our UN aircraft approached its des destination, we were told by the control tower, and we could see from our windows, that a, a thick layer of fog uh, had blanketed the airfield, and so our pilot was told to divert and hold over nearby Weimar until the fog cleared. Uh, with only minutes before our meeting with the German authorities, I read the last uh, dispatches from the field. The situation in Bosnia remained troubling. Only hours earlier, Sarajevo airport had once again been struck by mortar shells, and this on the heels of a machine gun attack on the city's trams, which had left uh, several civilians dead. The only hope for peace then on the table was the contact group plan and it too was, uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, dead. And so we entered into a hold over Weimar. 
as you know, a picturesque town bathed uh, in beautiful sunlight that particular day. And uh, as we were circling overhead, uh, we were all looking down at the main part of the town, teeming with, with visitors. And uh, of course, all of us knew that this town had a direct association with uh, Goethe, uh, Herder and Schiller, the height of German literary achievement. But as the plane circled with every 360 degree turn, uh, this dark uh, clearing or this clearing uh, beneath um, a cloud bank, it, it appeared dark to us, uh, came into view. Uh, and of course, it was um, the former uh, Buchenwald concentration camp. The juxtaposition of Weimar, always in sight and dressed in sunlight, and then Buchenwald in the shadows, appearing intermittently, uh, left a strong impression on us. Uh, for the human parallel was clear. No matter how brilliant our achievements, whether artistic, scientific, or technical, we still lived in Albert Camus' age of murder, where every now and then the evil and horrors some are capable of visiting or many others finds expression confirming to us what Cecil Lewis in 1936 described as the invincibility of man's stupidity. And so we returned to the International Criminal Court whose statute entered into force almost exactly 10 years ago. There are two features in particular that make it uh, truly exceptional. The first is captured elegantly uh, by Article 27 of the Roman Statute, often overlooked, but still the simplest and most profound article ever written into a multilateral treaty, or any other treaty for that matter. Uh, this uh, golden article of the Roman Statute represents the field over which the battle between law and politics has joined, with each discipline exerting its influence over the question of whether there should be a court in the first place, and it's worth recording the whole article. Paragraph 1 of Article 27 reads that this statute shall apply equally to all persons without any distinction based on official capacity, in particular, official capacity as a head of state or government, a member of parliament, an elected representative or government official shall in no case exempt a person from criminal responsibility under the statute, nor shall it in and of itself constitute a ground for reduction of sentence. In paragraph 2, it continues, immunities or special procedural rules which may attach to the official capacity of a person, whether under national or international law, shall not bar the court from exercising its jurisdiction over such a person. And so the irrelevance of official capacity as a statutory principle has now been accepted by the 121 states across the international community who have acceded to the Rome Statute and where the court has jurisdiction over the four atrocity crimes. Put another way, 121 countries, the majority of states now, have placed voluntarily not just their citizenry, but also their highest officials, every single one of them, under the criminal jurisdiction of an international criminal court. A customary right to sovereign immunity for senior officials from 121 states will, will henceforth be no bar to being held criminal liable before the ICC should crimes like these be apparent. It is a voluntary step so enlightened it simply has no historical equivalent or precedent. Now, no matter what the nature of the remaining criticisms directed at the court or its statute, one has to admire the nerve of those countries for acceding to it. Uh, while others may call this uh, naivete, naivete sorry, recklessness, or even fo uh, folly, and they will uh, bring forward their repertoire of arguments, the inevitable corruptibility of court officials, no clear accountability, unchecked prosecutorial powers, accuse it of being Western-backed, and so forth. But these arguments only bear uh, some importance uh, when the victims of those gravest of offenses are marginal to the discussion. In the final analysis, we build a war crimes court for the victims, because it is they and their kin who ultimately will decide whether a society will ever fully recover from the brutalities of war. No country or society can claw itself into a watertight state of lasting reconciliation 
once massive crimes have been committed, if the victims themselves and their views are not addressed as a central priority of the newly born state and of the international uh, community. Many, if not most states, have done otherwise, but they are gambling that somehow they will be spared uh, the, um, the chauvinistic nationalist, the bigot with the deadly skill, charm, who will then dig up the past to whip up popular support for some narrow design with potentially sinister consequences. Just look at Milosevic uh, or Taylor. Victims, therefore, are important if there is to be the necessary reckoning followed by a meaningful reconciliation. The ICC, the International Criminal Court, is rather unique when it comes to victims uh, themselves, and this is my, the second point about its historic quality. Uh, early in 2008, and for the first time in an international court, the pretrial chamber cleared the way for victims to take part in hearings, not as witnesses, but as victims in their own right. And for the first time, also, there is a court with a statute that not only provides for reparations, but also is in possession of a trust fund managed by a board from which so-called humanitarian payments could be provided in advance of a conviction to victims if the board deems it necessary and the court has no objection to it. When victims no longer exert any direct influence on our discussions of international justice or peace after war, we often find ourselves entering into a world of interminable debate with valid arguments being presented from every direction. Put the victim center stage, and I believe a conclusion can be reached. Ultimately, the question we must uh, raise and uh, answer ourselves is what do we as people and as states stand for? Do we have a collective conscience, and how do we respond to it? And here we recognize inevitably we live in a cultural kaleidoscope. And it goes without saying we require a diversity of cultural signatures to exist. They must exist throughout a wide range of human activity, not least human rights issues. And yet, at that most terrible extreme of criminal human behavior, should we not all respond as humanity in the same way? Could we not all agree there, at that point, that edge that would identify us, separate us human beings from animals with much lower mental faculties, where, to quote Nuremberg, the imagination staggers, could we not there meet in mind and agree on no impunity? But what of our other historical experiences? Do they not also shape our impressions? Are they not also important. After all, our independence as Asian states was in many instances hard fought uh, from our colonial masters and not without considerable struggle and pain. We are still in many cases applying sealant to the states we have created or which were created uh, uh, over the last 50 years and are becoming more integrated across a broad canvas of activity and now others, in some cases our former colonial masters, tell us we should give up some pivotal rights, like the customary right to sovereign immunity for the highest officials, to an international court. And so the tensions are plain to see when we examine the foundational document, the 2008 Charter of ASEAN, a noticeable balance is struck in Article 2, the Principles Article, between language and respect of state, States, state sovereignty, and other obligations contained within the, uh, within the terms international law and international humanitarian law, which would include obligations that are erga omnes. Now, what does this mean? The International Court of Justice, as many of you know, described the obligations or described obligations erga omnes in the Barcelona Traction case as, and I quote, the obligations of a state towards the international community as a whole. By their very nature, they are the concern of all states. In view of the importance of the rights involved, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection. They are obligations erga omnes. Such obligations derive, for example, in contemporary international law from, outlawing, uh, from the outlawing of acts of aggression and of genocide, etc., etc., etc. 
And as most of you know, there exists a virtual consensus over the 1948 Genocide Convention, the 1984 Tor Torture Convention, the Fort Geneva Convention, and the Hague Regulations insofar as they all meet the US Kogan's threshold. In other words, they re represent superior law uh, or overriding law precisely because they affect all states and not just the individuals directly affected by a crime. We can, therefore, infer from both Chapter 2 of the ASEAN Charter and Asia's general unwillingness to ratify the Rome Statute that while Asian states do, of course, recognize their obligations ergo omnis, and so they are sensitive to the atrocity crimes, what they are not yet prepared to do is cede some sovereignty by handing over through an instrument of ratification deposited at the UN jurisdiction to an international court. So they are themselves committed to upholding the law, but within their own national jurisdictions. That appears to be the crux of the issue. The overall picture, therefore, is not so bad after all, uh, or it's not so bad after all from the perspective of a supporter of the court. The crucial point is whether the remaining Asian countries who have not yet acceded to the Rome Statute believe that complementarity can work in practice. And this is the key principle by which the Rome Statute operates. The court, if it has jurisdiction, must defer the exercise of jurisdiction first to the national authorities, and only if those authorities are unable or unwilling to do so with the court uh, by prior agreement with the state then engage. The court, therefore, exists merely in the background, so to speak, a failed safe device, a net, to catch those who slip through or, fear of, or flee sorry, certain uh, national jurisdictions in search of impunity. As long as states implement their obligations over ominous and do, th do so faithfully, there is less of a reason for the court to be involved. But not all do, you see or at least that this has been the, our experience in the past. Procedurally, however, complementarity is highly complicated uh, when put into practice. And as you see now uh, with Libya and the discussions, uh, some have called it uh, arguments between the ICC and the Libyan authorities over where uh, Saif al-Islam al-Dafi should be tried, it will take time before the sequencing of who can do what when is understood. Moreover, and this is the crucial, this is a crucial point, it is not yet broadly accepted, as you know, that crimes against humanity as defined in Article 7 of the Roman Statute, have, uh, having only been codified recently, has reached the level of superior law. There is no doubt it can do so in due course, and an increasing number of courts worldwide already cite the Article 7 definition in the Roman Statute as authoritative. But these Article 7 offenses would, of course, have to be criminalized through national legislation for those individual states not party to the ICC to implement an expanding erga omnis regime. This would be easier for them to obtain nationally if they were to accede to the Roman statute rather than to remain outside of it. And so this brings me to my final few points. For those who, like myself, believe passionately in the need for the courts, and that humanity can ill afford not to have it, there is a sense of frustration that not more countries from Asia have ratified the Rome Statute. Making an argument for cultural relativism in defense of caution does not explain why Japan and the Republic of Korea have themselves ratified. Arguing that American pressure continues to deter countries from signing cannot explain why the Philippines has joined. Arguing it is a Western court is at odds with the fact that it is led by a Korean judge and an outgoing prosecutor from Argentina with a successor from the Gambia. And saying international criminal law is itself alien to us neglects, for example, the fundamental contributions to its jurisprudence from Judge Kwan at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. So I would like to think, uh, therefore, the impediments are twofold, one technical and one political. I've spoken about the technical in terms of the complexities of the court's operation, particularly complementarity, and how they must pan out into something more easily understood by our political machinery before we see further accession. 
And on the political front, we must try and overcome the fear that if we surrender our customary right to sovereign immunity in respect of the atrocities, uh, the atrocity crimes, this will nick the edge of a sovereignty and independence secured only within the last century, an edge which will then be rolled back against our will. That all of this is somehow bound up with all the other human rights considerations uh, which are and remain contentious. Ultimately, I believe, both these impediments will be overcome with time. We are probably in a 25-year transition from a time long stayed by far too many examples of criminal behavior in its most abominable form, where no justice was ever delivered to the victims, to a somewhat different world, where the victims will continue to migrate in our mind's eye from the corner of our collective field of vision uh, to its center. This is inevitable if we take the long view, because sadly, there is no shortage of cruel people willing to commit atrocities to make good on an objective, and so our publics, in, in still increasing numbers, will desire for something else, a much improved something else. My hope is that this enormous and increasingly successful continent of Asia will reconsider its caution in due course, and not just join the states parties of the Rome Statute, uh, but with all the talent it has available to it, lead them to, to a future existence, utterly, a uh, future human existence, utterly devoid of the worst forms of criminal excess. Maybe one day, if uh, successful in this, we could even make a war itself uh, unthinkable. I thank you for your kind uh, attention and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Exposition on the, uh, the nature of atrocity crimes, how the international community is dealing with it, and why Asia, as a as a group of countries, has been especially lacking in this respect. And the question whether we are headed towards a collective consciousness in this regard is a very is a very important one. So we've got about uh, 20 minutes, uh, and uh, Prince would like to take some questions. So we ask you to uh, pose your questions, given uh, in the interest of time. Could you be concise in your comment and question? Please introduce yourself before you go. I see, I see one here. Maybe we'll take three questions together, and then, uh, yes, please go ahead. Prince, I, uh, my question is whether the ICC remit extends to the use of the nuclear deterrent. I certainly heard Ambassador Shatter's views on it, and some other perspectives, and of course, different countries have different reservations which they express. I mean, just a few thoughts. You want to introduce yourself to that uh, principal? Yeah. Sorry, I'm Paul Supermani, I'm Chairman of Law Asia, but I also um, have, have a reserve appointment in the armed forces as head legal for the SAR. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, my name is Chang Li. I think most people here know me as a blogger, but I've also Unknown to most people, I've also written for Arab News Saudi Arabia. I work for the Saudi Embassy, and this topic actually covers one of the, the area of the Middle East. Now, I grew up in the era when Milosevic was torturing people in Europe, so I agree 100% with you in principle that the court is necessary. But a lot of people on the ground will argue that although you've given a case that is not a Western bad court, how is it that certain crimes committed by Asian or other Middle Eastern leaders are considered crimes, but when certain things done by Western leaders, nobody says anything, it's called self-defense. So how does the court um, justify this to the ordinary Asian or Middle Eastern on the ground? And then it leads to the next point that how powerful is the court without an international police force that has overriding authority? Because at the national level, the courts basically the right need the police force to enforce the laws they make. 
Thank you. Sir? Thank you very much, Chairman, sir. Uh, my name is Mike, I'm just a lay person. Your Royal Highness, you mentioned two specific matters with regard too many questions, but one particularly with regard to human, uh, humankind, humanity. But then you've forgotten that in today's world, um, you know, you look at the male of any beast looking for a female partner, but not human being anymore, either man or male, or, or, or woman for that matter. So I think that the redefinition of human, uh, humanity have to be a real look on that. So you see, it, it's common sense. And when you pointed out about common sense with regard to Singapore and the question of high caliber, then you, you, you couldn't understand to reconcile while well, in the case of conscience, it doesn't come by. Only two members of ASEAN seem to be, uh, and together with Jordan, agreeing on the terms of reference. So my question here is that in the context of your inquisitive mind, the question of uh, the ray of light, and the question of point of light, a royal touch that you give an impression to us. Here the issue is that what's wrong with the voices for reason and the voices for uh, the dialogue for reason? Do you see that this is a problem that the humanistic uh, dimension doesn't combine? So where is the common sense? Where is actually the conscience that you're expecting? Thank you. Uh, lastly, sir, uh, because when last year, due to the Arab Spring, uh, the ICANN conference was not done in Amman and it goes to Singapore. So my apology for that. Second is what your own country, uh, Jordan, has done, uh, which is in, in the Muslim world, which is a very great thing that you've done, uh, what is known as the Aman Doctrine, which was signed by all countries which had Muslim populations, including Singapore, by our current Minister of Muslim Affairs. But that's been blatantly uh, abused by the very Muslim countries where people kill each other unreservedly and quite against the concept or the belief of the religion which they profess to follow. I just want your comments on that. Thank, Thank you. you. So we've got four questions. Uh, ask the Prince if you can either combine some of them or answer them directly if you wish. I thank you all for the, the questions, and uh, all of them are, are excellent. The, the first question on nuclear deterrent. Uh, uh, at the Rome conference in 1998, there was considerable sympathy, and, and indeed the non-aligned movement argued for inclusion uh, under the weapons uh, provision of nuclear weapons. It seemed almost inconceivable that you could exclude them. But it was very clear that uh, those countries in possession, the nuclear weapon states, were not going to be in favor of this. And if we were going to hope for any consensus uh, during the negotiations, 
uh, we had to recognize that the weapons provision couldn't include nuclear weapons. That doesn't mean that there was a great deal of sympathy for their inclusion, but ultimately we knew it would blow the uh, agreement or the statute, uh, statute apart. Um, in uh, uh, the Kampala conference, the review conference for the Rome Statute, there was some mention of the reintroduction of uh, nuclear weapons, but it was very brief. And in the end, we were, uh, we did achieve uh, an, a consensus on the definition and the grounds for the exercise of jurisdiction on the crime of aggression. Uh, and uh, uh, any expansion of the weapons provision would have been detrimental to that. Uh, but again, there is uh, considerable sympathy for that. Um, in terms of uh, the discrepancies between Asia and Europe, and or let's say the West, and uh, events perhaps, I think uh, the questioner was alluding to events in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, uh, and why don't we see uh, a greater focus on, for instance, Afghanistan, where Afghanistan is a state party to the Rome Statute. Uh, I think it's, it's very clear that uh, given where we were in 2002, when uh, we had huge pressure on the court, the court could have easily collapsed at that stage, that uh, we are, have introdu introduced something new now to the international community. To expect it to work perfectly uh, would be uh, farcical, really. It's impossible to imagine that uh, happening right away. It will take 20 years before it begins to work effectively. It doesn't mean that the court hasn't explored and hasn't conducted preliminary, preliminary analyses into whatever happens in Afghanistan. And certainly the uh, Afghan authorities know that the court is always available. Uh, although it has to be said that if there is a credible uh, investigation into any particular incident, uh, that the court has no means to enter into a, 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 an investigation of its own, unless it believes that the investigation itself, that due process was not conducted and it was a farce uh, investigation. Um, the uh, uh, weakness in the system of there not being a police force is uh, absolutely noted. The court relies on the cooperation of all states, not just the state parties. But this will come. I mean, only a few years ago we were 60 states parties. Now we're 121. In a few more years it will be 150. And then soon you're getting to that point where you have universal. Now it's only a matter of time. Unless the court acquits itself unprofessionally in, its, in terms of its proceedings, or there's a financial uh, sort of scandal that would blow the court apart, it's only a matter of time before this we will reach a universal membership. And at that stage, I think we begin to see tighter cooperation with the court. And we're still working our way through this. Um, and uh, the collective conscience, again, I think, you know, uh, the argument I would make is that governments are not monoliths. In each government, you will have those who are more sensitive to these issues, and those others who, uh, who are less sensitive will be looking more at more strategic issues, uh, less victim-oriented or victim-centered uh, a less victim-centered approach. And, uh, and so you have these deep and intense discussions within governments. In time, I think there will be a growing awareness that these are not marginal issues. Victims' issues are not marginal. They're very center to whatever it is that we're examining. And throwing cement at a problem is not quite adequate. In the end, you are left with a tenderness there that you have to deal with in terms of what's in people's minds and in, in their memories. Um, in terms of uh, the Middle East, I should also, I should mention that, of course, as you all know, the uh, statute entered into force in July of 2002, so it's whatever has happened uh, after that that it falls under the jurisdiction of the court, not prior to 2000, July 2002, so there's no retroactivity like that. Um, and uh, I thank you for your very kind words about the uh, Amman message. Uh, I mean, it's clear that, uh, that uh, there is an issue that we have to examine, all of us as Muslims. It's really more up to, for, uh, up to us as Muslims to uh, look at our own house and, uh, and maintain order within it, and then to expect that our Western friends should do it or get involved. 
And uh, I think you are right in saying that there's much work to be done there. I don't think anyone would disagree with that assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have the next set of questions, perhaps. And so we can get Uh, I'm Arun Baran. I'm with the Asia Research Institute here at NUS. And my question is actually a short one. You know, you made a distinction between crimes against individuals, and you started out crimes against humanity. And then the example you gave was of that shooting of that seven-year-old girl and her younger sister by a sniper. And you, you described that as a crime against humanity. But you also have shootings in schools, for instance like in the U.S. cases, against, uh, you know, kids by others. Okay, now, I, I presume you would not consider that to be crimes against humanity. So I was wondering, what are your reasons for thinking that that particular case of that sniper shooting those girls uh, was, 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 was an exemplary case of a crime against humanity, since this distinction is so important? for the case in me. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Sylvie? So I'm Sylvia from Alsace. With so much happening on the anti-terror front, how does uh, the ICC view terrorism related, that is anti-terror crimes, you know, like state terror? Anti-terror? State terror. State terror, I think. Uh, one more question, perhaps, before I ask the principal answer. Okay, if not, then maybe we'll take these two questions first. Okay. Um, the, the shooting of the two uh, girls, uh, it, it basically, um, it could be characterized either as willful killing under war crimes article 8, uh, or it could be characterized as crimes against humanity because there's an overall pattern to the uh, sort of um, to the uh, targeting of civilians, uh, and the conditions that have to be met are clear. That if there is a systematic or widespread uh, approach to the commission of the crime, it elevates the crime from being uh, simply one of uh, an ordinary killing to one beyond it. And basically, we followed exactly the Nuremberg principles that you're targeting. Uh, they were targeting a recognizable group, uh, ethnic or religious, and it was being done in a very systematic way, and that qualifies it as something beyond uh, an ordinary crime. So either or could be applied here. Um, and you could have, and we had to, when we were looking at the constituent elements of each crime, you know, we had to take into account in our description of the offense, the first act, you know, so you have the first killing, let's say, in an unfolding genocide. That may appear at that moment to be an ordinary crime, the first killing. But in retrospect, if it's the first killing of a planned uh, program of annihilation of part or, or a whole of uh, a people, then of course you then have to reappraise the context and then it becomes, the, you know, it could be part of a genocidal you know, uh, action. And so uh, one has to look at these uh, actions on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, the uh, issue of state terrorism or anti-terror uh, crimes, I think uh, we have to all, always be aware that the state has a special responsibility, that the state has a lawful monopoly on the use of crime, but it has to be lawful. Uh, I think what we are trying to do is remove, again, the excess in human behavior. Killing of, the killing of children uh, in, it cannot be justified in any, any circumstances. There's no human, it's a military necessity achieved by the killing of, of children, or the defenseless, or the disabled, or, 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 or um, uh, uh, women or who are themselves in certain parts of the world or, characterized as defenses. I've seen this in the Congo, for example. And we're not trying to render war, of course, as you know, uh, uh, we're not trying to prescribe it or prohibit it, but what we're trying to say is much that happens in war 
that is criminal and excessive, and that has to be curtailed. Uh, otherwise, what, what are we proud about? That we invented a new iPad or a new phone, or that we, you know, our, GDP, our GDPs are growing at X percentage points, or we reduce the deficit? Well, so what? In the final analysis, you know, have we managed to extinguish the beast within us that uh, allows us to commit, you know, crimes of, of staggering proportions? And only then can we celebrate humanity as having achieved something really noble and, and great. And I think that's the opinion that one has to hold. Uh, it's probably me. Uh, thank you for a very excellent uh, presentation. May I try and answer your why? Yes. Or why in Asia? You know, there are three problems. I think you have also hinted. One is the double standard, the question you had earlier, of uh, the Western dominated world order is still. Asia is rising, but the perceptions are very, very clear. Uh, secondly, the new sovereignty, which you mentioned in your own uh, you know, lecture, you, you, at one place you mentioned. And the third is the possible political or strategic use of these instrumentalities in many cases. Now, uh, many of the arguments which can be built along these three lines uh, are, uh, can be termed hypocritical, maybe <coughs> Uh, coming more out of fear than reality. But the problem is that the, the, those who dominate the world, or even the idea of ICC, for instance, they have not gone into clearing these doubts to the Asian countries. There has been absolutely no dialogue on some of these issues. Uh, and uh, credible assurances are coming back. Now, you, you know the question of an Algerian judge being in ICC, doesn't convince because it's an instrument. Uh, today you have an Algerian uh, Chief Justice, uh, tomorrow there may be somebody else. The, 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 the way, and that's where the, I think this is a debate linked to the R2P question, uh, both between the West and the uh, Asia or, or, or the rest, put it this way. So I think unless uh, some uh, work at the, at the uh, uh, explaining level is being done, with credible evidence. <laughs> Look at the Sri Lankan case, I mean, the LTT's present example. Uh, the Sri Lankan perception is that you have all the terrorist crimes. If somebody from Afghanistan or Pakistan goes to the ICC and says that this is what US has done, will you register a case? Will you uh, pursue it? You know, these are the questions which come up in the mind. And unless there, is a, there are credible responses to some of these questions, I think uh, your why would remain there. Thank you, Brock. So I'll ask the Prince to respond to this, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's our wrap up as well. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a very thoughtful uh, question. Uh, you know, Samuel Johnson once said that uh, nothing would ever be achieved if all possible objections must first be overcome. And so we can erect in our mind's eye all the imperfections of humanity as a, a cause not to create something like this, that we are too fallible, we're too bloody, we are sadistic, or we are sociopaths, and, and really uh, take a very dim approach of humanity and say, and there's no hope to do this. But, you know, I haven't found one person who's been witness to these sorts of crimes who's thought like that. You know, not one person I served with in the former Yugoslavia emerged from that conflict and thought, you know, we just go back to our old jobs and we don't think about these things or change the way the world responds to them. And so the arguments that you put forward are all cogent. But that's only because we're thinking about the, the state, about the government in power. We're not thinking about the victims. If we think about the victims, our approach changes and we say, well, it will be imperfect, at least in the beginning, uh, because we're still experimenting and trying to find our way. But it doesn't mean that we don't try. And uh, assuming we didn't have the ICC, uh, well, what new institution do we have to guarantee that the next century, or this century that we're in, won't be as bloody as the last century? 
Uh, we can't rely on the Security Council because it's proven itself to be utterly inept in dealing with these issues. Uh, and so what else is there? Uh, the magnanimity of, of you know, the various governments around the world, that's not good enough. And uh, so I, I, I take a, a, a more uh, sort of progressive approach. And there's certainly the questions that you asked are questions that are pertinent. There's no doubt about it, that it has to be a perceived you know, a, a, a fairness in the way that the court approaches all of this. And if it's not perceived to be fair, then it undermines itself. But the court is regulated by a statute, and, and all too often, the more you look at these individual cases, you realize that the court really had no position to investigate because the national authorities were investigating themselves. And only if they weren't could the court then become involved. But certainly, where the Security Council makes referrals, and the Security Council is a political body, you know, here there's a great source of anxiety and uh, unhappiness. And I, I conclude with, you know, uh, the Security Council as an example, how bad it is. In, uh, in 2004, I was in uh, The Hague uh, with some colleagues, amongst whom there was the former uh, ambassador of uh, uh, South Africa, a friend to all of us, Ambassador Kamala. And while we were there, it was on a Saturday, uh, we heard that the LRA, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army, operating in northern Uganda, had herded 300 men and women into huts and burnt them alive. And, uh, and the UN had been on the scene, and, and this was photographed, the, the aftermath was photographed. So I said to uh, Ambassador Kamal, well, I'm quite sure the Council will meet, the Security Council will meet in an emergency session tomorrow to take some action. And he looked at me sort of rather surprised that I even said this, because naturally there was no emergency meeting of the Security Council. There was no meeting of the Security Council, let alone an emergency meeting. There was no comment made by any of the major capitals about this. Um, it was as if it happened, and it, it, it was expected to happen. After all, this is Africa, and this is what they do to one another. Two weeks after this, on the 6th of March, 1994, sorry, 2004, uh, there was the, the, the terrible bombings um, that uh, were perpetrated by Al Qaeda in Madrid. And, I, and of course, my colleagues were there, and the council met in emergency session under a Spanish presidency Monday morning, and they put out, I think it was a draft resolution, or was it passed a resolution? Uh, they had targeted ETA in the resolution by mistake, and then it turned out to be Al Qaeda. But, you know, it was amazing, the, dispar the discrepancy here. So 300 African women and children, disposable, 200 European kills, appallingly, and of course the council reacts. Well, why didn't the council react on the previous occasion? And is this acceptable? I mean, do we want to be in this situation? And if, if countries have a gripe with the ICC, well, propose something better. You know? Uh, otherwise, you know, when it's your turn next, and no one can be sure that you know that these things are not cyclical, you know, it's no point crying at that stage. You know, there has to be there has to be a more mature approach to dealing with this. So I I, I, I think the points you raised are very are very cogent, and these are serious points. Uh, but I think we also have to have a and and I think the, the fundamental point that you said that essentially we're not properly explaining ourselves. Is, is, is absolutely clear. How would the ICC be different from Security Council? Well, the ICC, in the case of the LRA, did, uh, did put out the statement. Yeah. Well, yeah, it has to be properly conveyed. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. So, on that somber note, <laughs> I'll bring proceedings to a close. Uh, it leads me now to thank uh, on all on your behalf as well, Highness, for this very illuminating lecture and for taking your questions. And also to all of you for taking time off to come and spend this afternoon with us for your questions. Now, uh, there will be tea outside. I'm sure many of you will have questions for the Royal Highness, so I invite you to mix your thing outside over a cup of tea. Thank you very much. Well, just before that, we'd like to, you to present a token of appreciation to the Royal Highness on behalf of the